G'day, Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series and welcome to episode 2 on how to service your 4x4 or more importantly your Series Land Rover. Today what we're going to look at is how to chuck your spark plugs in and also your distributor points and on top of that we're going to actually do a complete uh, oil change of the actual drive line within the Series 2 and I'll show you a few other tips and tricks along the way too, as always. So stay tuned for another interesting video. Rightio, so I've already covered in a, another video on our channel how to do your spark plugs and points. So I'm not going to go over it in uh, great nauseating detail as I've done in the past. But I'm going to show you a few little tips and uh, tricks that I didn't show in the other video. Now one of the most important things is to change your spark plugs regularly. That's what I do. They're easy to forget. I haven't changed the spark plugs in the Series 2 in about probably two years, so um, that's fine. They're probably getting close to actually um, needing to be actually changed, so um, I'll change those today too. The points are fine, they seem to be working okay. I haven't had any uh, issues uh, with them. Um, there's a few little tips and tricks you need to do to keep your points running uh, spot on in these vehicles. But uh, yeah, other than that, pretty straightforward. Now we will look at the drive line too, and I'll show you some of the tips and tricks you need there because uh, you do actually need to make a specialised tool to actually drain your front and rear differentials in a Series 2 Land Rover. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll get into it and uh, we'll get the ignition system running right and uh, go from there. Rightio, the bowels of the beast. So I'll just move the workshop manual there. Um, now one thing that happens with these vehicles is obviously the plastic heel here wears over time when that happens obviously your gap in between two parts of your ignition points uh, tends to close and when that happens obviously the spark can't jump across it as effectively and you start getting misfires occurring in the vehicle so that's that's something that you just need to keep an eye on uh, you'll generally get that after a couple thousand kilometers so what we need to do in order to change the points is we need to take out the cylinder that the motor fires on first, which in this motor is cylinder one. Most motors, that's the case. If you've got an early Jaguar though, they actually uh, fire on cylinder two. So make sure you check the firing order of your motor. So we'll take that out, we'll put the crankshaft in and we'll just rotate the motor over um, so we get it on the compression stroke when it's coming up and we'll get it at top dead centre and then we'll actually change this over. Okay, so I've got the crank handle engaged. And what I can actually do is I can then actually feel when I'm actually on the exhaust stroke and the compression stroke. I haven't got the ignition switched on so the car's not gonna start up or anything like that, but I can slowly turn the motor over and get it in the position that I want. I'll give you a shot inside the actual engine bay and you can see what I'm talking about. So you can see when I turn the crank handle, the valves are going up and down, but the shaft in the distributor is moving. So what I need to do, now it's on the compression stroke, is I need to get the actual heel of the actual point right on the apex 
or the point of that shaft. Which is nearly there. Yep, that's it. So as you can see, it's basically square, but that is pretty much spot on there. And that's how you want it. So now what I can do is I can take those points out, I can put a new set of points in, and I know that when I put the new sets of points in, I can just adjust it at uh, 0 0.45 of an inch. I think, oh no, sorry, 45 mil. 45 mil? 0 0.45 mil um, is the measurement you want to use and I can just put that in all good to go and the other thing is too I've checked the valves um, I've checked my rocket cover gasket that seems okay so I can put that back on also but I really just did that to sort of demonstrate so that's that's really all there is to it in regards to your ignition points so I'll chuck this in I'll put a new set of spark plugs in and we'll move on to the next step so here's the new ignition points and they're made none other by Lucas uh, one of the things that you must do if you're using Lucas points is install them before it actually goes dark because you'll never get it started <coughs> the other thing you must do also if you're using Lucas products is you never ever ever never ever store them with the actual box open. The reason why you do that, or you don't do that, is because the smoke actually escapes from the wiring inside it. So don't do that. And you know, Lucas isn't all that bad. You know, I actually got something installed a few weeks ago and it's for, for, oh. <laughs> oh, I should have got a Bosch pacemaker instead. But all jokes aside, uh, look, it doesn't matter what brand you get, they'll do the job. So anyway, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's what they look like, and uh, yeah, we'll take these out. Rightio, so it's getting a little bit later in the afternoon, so a little bit of liquid inspiration. Now, we've fitted the points, and with the spark plugs, what you need to look out for is what the compression ratio is of your motor. Now, if you've got a 7 to 1 compression ratio, like in this motor here, then the spark plugs that you'll need to use will actually be different to those compared to the spark plugs required in the 8 to 1 compression ratio. So keep that in mind. For the 7 to 1 that we've got here, I'm using a B6ES and that is NGK. And I tend to use NGK. Um, they work fine. You can get platinum plugs and all the rest, but um, yeah, it's you just got to change them, so you're better off just to do that. So anyway, so I'll put these in, and we'll tighten them up. Now, when you come to actually tightening up the spark plug, they need to be tightened up to about 25 foot pound, I think. If my memory serves me correct, which. I've done it that many times, you just kind of get to know what, uh, how much 25 foot-pounds is, which is about there. So that's cylinder one done, and you just, I always do it uh, one by one with your spark plug leads. Uh, it's just a lot easier. You can use the old trick and uh, Adam's obviously uh, 
shown me this over the years, a friend of mine, is that you can um, use clothes pegs and then just put one, two, three, and four on them. And that works very effectively too. But um, <clears throat> I just like to remove the chance of error, really. And the other thing you should be looking at too as you pull your spark plugs out is actually looking at the condition. You know, are they white? If they're white, then they've been running at too high a temperature. If they're oily, then that says that you've probably got a, uh, a dicky valve guide seal, which particularly if you've got a motor that hasn't run in a long time that's usually the first thing that goes is the valve guide seal and it's not hard to replace them you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it so yeah I'd um, certainly recommend that and certainly if you are buying a vehicle or a motor that hasn't been run in a long time I'd certainly be pretty suspect of them um, yeah it's just a the rubber breaks down or it goes brittle and it just doesn't seal right um, these motors just weren't really made to sit around and do nothing. So that's not too bad. So you really want to be pulling them out. The spark plugs and they should be nice and almost have look a little bit rusty on the end. Uh, no oil. They might be slightly black but that's okay. And the other thing, it depends on what kind of driving you're doing too. If you're just doing short runs to the shop and back, then the car's never really going to get up to temperature. So that'll affect things too. That's where particularly if you're using a uh, uh, more mature vehicle, it's really good to take it for a good solid run. Just blows all the gunk out the back of the vehicle and um, puts it all over the Honda Prius that's behind it probably. But anyway... <coughs> Yeah, you can't win it all. You can't save everyone. Right. So this is cylinder four. And I tell, to tell you what, it's one of the reasons why I love four cylinders because there's only four of them. Doing a V8, man, what a pain. You know, I do. I do like the sound of a V8, but they. You know, it's $7 each, to give you an idea, $7 each or three, £3.50 for a uh, spark plug here. Imagine buying eight of those. Tell you what, I wouldn't be drinking any of this. Mmm. I'd be lucky if I can afford water. Okay. So I just do them up just so they're ever so slightly firm. Just a little, you just feel it where they're starting to bind and then just, just a little turn. And that's pretty much for me, 25 foot pounds. Now if you're not sure and it's a really good skill, get your torque wrench out or get your mate's torque wrench and just feel where it actually clicks and you'll get a bit of an idea. But if you go too, too crazy with it and you've had your wheat bix, you'll just strip it and a lot of work to fix it so take your time enjoy yourself no rush no rush hmm might have to get a top up okay right so that's that done there now when I took off the actual uh, rocket cover this happened so we're going to go inside and I'm going to show you a little trick because this is something that happens a lot to series Land Rovers. So we'll just go into the workshop. Righty-o, so I've changed my mind. I am doing it the proper way. So we've got a nut here and then we've got the dome nut on top. So I'm using a half inch spanner, 13 mil. So I'm tightening them both up against one another, keeping the pressure on and I just simply turn 
the stud in. Just need to do it like that. On the bottom. Pressure. Right, so now it's getting tight. And I just keep the pressure on the two nuts. That's as far as we're going to go. Now, when I want to actually take the two nuts off, I just push them back together like that. Take that off. So I've put a little bit of Loctite in there. Um, you need to check what kind of Loctite you're actually going to use. Some uh, forms of uh, Loctite or thread, I guess, um, sealant or whatever, um, doesn't actually like oil or won't actually respond well to an oil environment like this or an environment filled with oil. So uh, it'll actually break down. So you need to do your homework in regards to that. Okay, so that's pretty much all done. We'll chuck the rocket cover back on. Okay, so to drain your drive line in your Series 2, what you need to do is get yourself a couple of oil pans or a container of some kind, and then you're going to need to get yourself some flat steel. Now, on the Series 2, they actually have uh, a brass bung or sump plug or whatever you want to call it plug in the bottom of the diff housing gearbox and uh, transfer case now what's actually in there is a slot and you need a piece of steel like this to actually slot up in there and then I tend to use a shifter and use that to actually crack it off get it out and off you go so really really simple on the later Series 2s, I think 2A, uh, later 2As and Series 3, they've actually got it so you can actually fit a socket onto it and then that would have been the 2A, then the Series 3, you've got it where you can fit a half inch ratchet in and you can actually undo it just like a conventional uh, plug, but uh, not on the Series 2 anyway. So we'll get underneath the vehicle and we'll start draining away. So while that drains, there's just a couple few, I guess, top tips in regards to Series 2 Land Rover. The way the actual bung is situated on the bottom of the differential is actually really interesting. This kind of shows how um, vehicles have evolved over time. This basically has the bung right on the bottom, right in the center. So when you hit a rock or you hit obstacle of some kind that you don't intend to but you do um, it tends to burr it over so sometimes you can't actually get the bung out and you have to get in there with a the die grinder and actually grind out all the little burrs to then get the brass plug to come out you'll notice particularly on the county and the defender and pretty much all the other major four-wheel drives Nissan, uh, Nissan Patrol, Toyota Land Cruisers they all have the sump, sump plug or the plug for the differential off to either the right or the left and uh, that's the reason why I haven't had any problems here but that's one of the things that you need to look at if you've purchased one of these vehicles and you're actually doing the service for the first time now <clears throat> I've got the gearbox draining away I've got the front differential draining away too but uh, what oil do you put in it? Well, once again, it's like motor oil. Everyone has an opinion. Uh, when I first started knocking around with these vehicles, you could just go and get Valvoline SAE 90 straight, and that's what they recommend. In the manual, in the workshop manual, that's what you'll, that's all you'll see is SAE 90, SAE 90, SAE 90, unless it's the motor. But it's quite hard to get straight SAE 90 oil nowadays. And to be honest, in cooler conditions, if you're situated in Europe, 
um, or in the southern hemisphere, a little bit further south than I am in Tasmania and New Zealand, uh, you'll find it's actually a real pain to actually try and change gear first thing in the morning. So what I actually use, I'll just give it a nice hug because I love it so much, is this here. And this is 7590. Now this actually works really well for, I guess, temperate environment. Um, temperate, I mean like temperate climate. Um, obviously over summer I'll use a slightly thicker viscosity oil because this actually won't be sufficient to actually cool the transmission down and particularly the rear differential. So um, 7590 works really well. This is uh, high-tech oil and I've used these on and off for, for probably 10 years and uh, in my mind it is the best transmission oil and they produce the best oils ever um, that I've ever come across not ever just the ones that I've come across so once I've finished with the Castrol as you saw in the other video I'll be going over to uh, to high tech because I found a place that sells it the reason why it's so good is when you see the oil it's almost clear there's no impurities in it at all um, if you go and buy a cheap oil, there'll be so many impurities in it, it's not funny. You can buy a really cheap one called, um, buy a mob called Home Brand. And you can buy it at your supermarket here for like four bucks for five litres. And it comes out and it looks like the oil that I pulled out of the sump, out of this after 5,000 Ks. It just looks like, you know what. So make sure you get yourself a good transmission oil to put in. Um, there's a lot of contention, so it's really important to understand how um, much of a difference it can actually make by getting the right viscosity or the right thickness of oil to put into your transmission. Now, I have to make this really clear, this, this isn't just pertaining to series Land Rovers, it actually affects every single vehicle out there. And the whole point of actually the different viscosities is because we're trying to reduce friction. Now, if you imagine a cog or a gear spinning around really, really quickly, it's coming into contact with another gear and meshing together. Now, if you rub your hands together really quickly, you'll feel that they get really hot, and that's the build-up of friction. And the whole point of motor oil and gearbox oil is to actually stop or inhibit the heat reaching a point where it's going to be destructive to the temperament of that cog or that bearing and or that bush or whatever it may be because that's then going to cause that to obviously break down and fail. Now this is what happens if the viscosity of the oil that you're putting in your vehicle isn't right for that environment. What will actually happen is it no longer has the ability to be able to minimize the destructive nature of the heat that's building up due to that friction. When the oil starts failing and breaking down, that causes damage to occur. And I've actually seen this occur within differentials, particularly in series Land Rovers, because I had to pull a few apart and obviously get some help from a good friend of mine, Ben at Goldfields Off-Road, to fit the air lockers in the Series 3 and we saw some pretty interesting signs which Ben picked up um, due to the oil actually having failed. So you really need to be mindful of it. Here in the goldfields of Western Australia we see a huge climactic change. Uh, today it's about probably 15 degrees centigrade. In summer it can easily push up to close to 50 degrees centigrade. So you really need to change your oil to match the environment. A prime example of this can be seen with the 2.6 litre. Now this actually, uh, if it was going to South Africa or a warmer climate, could be fitted with an oil, cooling, oil cooler. And you can also get a kit for the 2.25 litre too. So just something to keep in mind. Anyway, we'll hop in the car. There's a couple 
more tips and tricks I just want to talk to you about in regards to the transmission and stuff to look for if you've bought a series vehicle, you've just got it back on the road and you're doing a few tests. And that'll probably be enough information for today. But anyway, we'll hop in the series two. I'll tell you about what to look forward, uh, what to look for, sorry, in the transmission and transfer case, and also what do you need to do if you've got an overdrive unit what extra servicing do, needs to be done. So we'll hop in there. <clears throat> so I'll need to use a couple diagrams to explain what I'm going to talk about, so just bear with me. But basically what you need to look for, if you are buying a series Land Rover, there's a couple things I would really suggest that you do. First thing is you're gonna spend probably maybe a month of Sundays, actually taking the floor plates out and the transmission tunnel here. Once you've done that, what you really need to do is you need to take the selector, gear selector or the gear stick off. And I really encourage that you actually take the top of the gearbox off. Now by doing that and shining a torch in there, you can actually have a look at all the gears. And you can also get a rough idea of the wear on the synchro cones which you have synchros in the Series 2 and 2A on 3rd and 4th. Series 3 is synchro for all forward gears, not in reverse, and that's pretty common for most gearboxes. Um, one of the reasons why they do that is because reverse is a very low gear, and obviously um, you can end up doing a lot of damage if you don't have a good strong gear there and straight cut gears are the strongest because there's a greater amount of surface area in contact with the each gear but anyway I won't go into that too much more so you want to check that out one of the other things you want to look for is put it all back together and go for a run now a really good one to do is find a hill and put it in fourth when you're driving down the hill and you've got your hand free of the gear, gear stick if it pops out into neutral, then you know there's something wrong. That means the actual, there's a spring or a, yeah, there's a spring. And this actually is on the shaft. And this spring, or spring piece of steel, actually helps to hold the gear in place. Now, some people in the past have rebuilt the gearbox. And what they've probably done, if they have rebuilt the gearbox, is they haven't replaced that actual uh, spring bit of steel and because of that that's fatigued so when you go down the hill and you're letting it just coast along it'll pop out now if that doesn't phase you too much all you do is you just simply put your hand on the gear uh, the gear stick another thing that you want to look for is when you're doing that take your foot off the accelerator now this is really important what you want to hear is virtually nothing, just a nice, perfect hum. But if you're going down the hill and you hear like a, almost like a rumble, like a very, very subtle, and you're starting to feel a bit of vibration actually in the floor, floor pan, then that tells you one thing. The actual transfer case itself is a shaft, and this runs basically from the back of the transmission brake right through to the front of the transfer case. Now in the case of the Series 2 there's a number of tapered roller bearings in there. Now to get the preload or the pressure right on the actual bearing itself there's a number of shims that are actually behind the speedo housing. Don't worry I'll show you some pictures and some diagrams to explain this to you better. So what's happened is that bearing has worn in or bedded in and there's a little bit of free play. So when you're coasting along, you've got actually no load on the bearing. So it can actually move in and out ever so slightly. And that's where you'll get that noise occurring. So that's something really important to note. Now to fix that, you need to take the speedo housing off and the transmission brake off, and you'll have a heap of shims. What you need to do is probably take the thinnest shim out Put it back on, test the preload, and this is all mentioned in the workshop manual, 
and once you've got the preload right, go for a run, see how it goes. It can take quite a bit, but once you've got it set, you'll pretty much never have to do it again. So that's the top tip I'd give you there. In regards to the Roma Drive Overdrive unit, which we've covered here on the channel, what do you need to service it? Nothing. You really don't need to service it at all. What you need to do is make sure that the oil that's actually in your transfer case, because it uses oil from the transfer case, is kept very, very clean and do that routinely, as I do anyway. And really, that's all you need to do. You can, a little bit of oil's kept in the actual unit itself, but that's flowing in and out of the unit all the time. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's been designed by an absolute genius by the name of Ray Wood and he's really thought about it a lot and as I've said before he used to design components for aircraft so he's really designed it at the top top echelon of um, engineering quality and he's a proper inventor and engineer in my mind so that's really it um, one more top tip I'd say if you do buy a series 3 is do what I told you previously pull the gear stick off at the bottom of the actual gear stick through the actual um, there's a knuckle at the bottom and this actually goes into the selector or the selectors around the bottom there there's actually a nylon bush and unbeknown to me I don't know why the hell they did it but basically that nylon bush will wear out it'll break off and then it becomes very difficult to change gear gears so make sure regardless of the age of the vehicle change that because the last thing you want is to be out in the big back and beyond somewhere and you have that fail it's an absolute pain but anyway that's pretty much it for transmission and ignition systems i know it's been a bit of a long video i do apologize for that but we're all about going in depth here and i can't really compress it into a one minute quick nippy little tutorial and everything that I've told you here today is stuff that you will not find in the workshop manual and it's stuff that you may find on a forum but let's be honest you'd be spending hours upon hours over a week or two weeks trying to find it so I think it's still pretty quick anyway look if you are enjoying the content here at seriously series then I do encourage you to support us via patreon and obviously via our website and if you're new to the channel then you know what to do. Click on that subscribe button down below. Click on that notification button too. And more importantly, if you have any further questions that you want answered, or you have some tips and tricks yourself that you want to share with the world, then put a comment in the comment section down below. And I hope to see you in our next video.